diagnosed uh, almost 10 years ago now uh, with follicular lymphoma. basically said, you know, there are basically four options. It's kind of up to you, you know, wherever you want to start. And in my mind, I was like, wait a minute, you're the doctor, okay? Some further conversation with him, I came to understand that it was an indolent form of cancer, uh, slow growing, that it wasn't something I needed to get out of my body immediately, although my mind was like, let's just drop the drugs, get going. And he said, you know, I think you should go and see some of these experts. When I got to my third doctor, she had said to me, you know, I said, so what's the prognosis? And she goes, basically, we're going to beat it down. It's going to come back. We're going to beat it down again. And we're going to continue to do this until we can't beat it down. Some of my background is reading uh, body language, and I kind of figured something was not quite right. Uh, and uh, long story short is uh, went through the process, talked to my primary care physician. Uh, he couldn't look me in the eye. And we're, we've been friends for 10, 15 years. Out, I had been friends for about 10 or 15 years at that time outside of him being my doctor. And it wasn't until I got to the third doctor that I knew for sure something was up. But I, I already kind of suspected something was going on. At the time, I lived in Chicago, and I had some uh, great, uh, some very great uh, doctors and facilities available out there, Northwestern University of Chicago, Loyola, and Rush. And he had given me some names of the local um, lymphoma specialists, and it turns out one of them actually is one of the top specialists in the world. But I had no clue what to ask. But So he, I said to go do this, so I went out. And by the time I got to the third doctor, uh, I guess I had an idea of some questions to ask, okay? Um, and uh, they all were kind of the same, looking the same way, uh, which was, you know, it, it's, uh, if you looked at, you must probably have heard, you know, someone lit up like a Christmas tree. Well, I literally lit up like a Christmas tree. And that's enough to, to, to kind of unsettle you a bit. And, um, but they all were, were of the, the mindset that, you know, this is borderline watch and wait. You know, it's like, what were you talking about? And they said, well, you really don't need to do anything. Well, I wound up not having a typical pathway. Uh, so, and that kind of goes back to, we went, I went back, uh, it was actually my uh, wife at the time. Uh, she had pulled out a photo of my daughter, who is, was about 20 years old at the time. My daughter was, you know, a little, you know, year, year and a half old, and we were at Disney World. She goes, oh, John, look at your neck, you know, because I had all the, when you look, you could see that I had the lymph nodes. And that was, going back through photos, for sure, we were able to confirm that since 2001, I had had the disease. And I had lymph nodes that were waxing and waning and so on and so forth, and not that any of the doctors ever did anything wrong, because that's pretty normal when you get sick, your lymph nodes bro and then they go away so after two or three weeks if they're gone we don't worry about those kinds of things uh anyway i had it since 2001 so this watch and wait stuff uh i had had the bliss of not knowing so i had 14 years of at least 14 years of not knowing that i had cancer i had some benefits because my brother actually has been in the field for about 40 years not a, not as a researcher but uh in the business side of things and had a lot of contacts and you know his background in microbiology and the rest of that stuff so so that helped a little bit uh started to delve into reading medical papers and not that i understood them all uh you know i had to use google quite a bit to, to define some terms but um, i started to get an understanding of things and what what possibilities there were and one of the things that i think all of us want to do is is to matter in some way in some shape whether it's small or large or however it winds up being and in my particular case, one of my bucket list items was to help them learn. Okay, it was incurable. That sucked. Um, but, you know, hey, you know, on average, I got 18 years left. So it's not like, you know, I'm doomed. Okay. 
So uh, this was one of the things that I decided to do, and that's what kind of brought me down the clinical trial path, was the ability to perhaps give something back or help them learn, okay? This one seemed like a, you know, a great one to take a peek at and, and, and go through that. So that became part of my journey was to, uh, since I had time, since I could explore things, since I could try things out, that um, I, I'd start to do these clinical trials. And, you know, still when I needed, when I, when I needed to have, uh, when I would need to have uh, treatment, I certainly would do the treatment. But I mean, if it was an option and it wasn't, it wasn't a rush, I was going to give it the clinical trial path. See, in my case, because it doesn't, it, follicular lymphoma at the time did not have a very defined pathway. So you had to be, get comfortable with, and this is, gets back to your clinical trials, making decisions about things that you don't know about and that they don't know about and they're upfront about it. You know, it's, it's look, we don't know if this will or won't. Um, that's why it's in clinical trial. It, you know, may or may not help you. Since I was going to have to make informed decisions, I was going to basically, what I would like, the way I'd like to describe it is I became the CEO of my body. And so uh, you get competing uh, points of view, and it's not that they're, they're in disagreement with each other. It's just that they have different patient experiences. So not everyone, you know, uh, agreed on everything. So you, you start at, you start, you have to get comfortable in my, because it was unknown. Uh, and the fear of the unknown is the thing that people are scared the most about. You had to get comfortable with it, okay? And um, understand that you were going to make the, you know, you're making an informed decision. And, and one of the questions I'd ask every single one of them is that I learned, learned to ask was, you know, whether they said no treatment or this treatment or that treatment is, why do you think that's the best option? Okay. And what are the other options that are out there, whether or not you have access to them? Okay. And that, that you're aware of. Okay. And um, that, the very first clinical, that led me to my, the very first clinical trial. Um, the, uh, you know, even before right to try, there were ways to, to do that. Okay. Um, you know, but the, the doctors were at risk by, by doing that, okay, uh, by making those kinds of decisions. Um, so, I mean, I, I educated myself, I informed, you know, not everyone can do that, uh, it, to inform myself as best I can, and then, you know, learning to ask questions. Most of those were, uh, I was able to do locally because I was in Chicago. Had I not been in Chicago, which probably wouldn't have been able to do it. Some of the uh, hospitals and cancer centers, and, and there are a whole slew of other uh, charitable organizations um, that'll, if you need, if you need a, an airplane, if you need a, a, an ambul a flight ambulance, they'll pay for it. And, yeah, if you need to stay somewhere, all of them generally have, not all of them, but most of them uh, have some, some, some pathway that makes that work for you. Um, Financially, though, uh, that that was that was a change. I mean, I had a business that, you know, was uh, a very successful business, um, and um, I basically went from, you know, making what I was making to zero, and I was just very fortunate that uh, I had uh, uh, put away money, and because uh, there's a lot of people who do run into uh, you know financial hardships about this. I you know, I joke about it, but uh, I, I went from, you know, uh, working 70 hours a week to having to sleep 70 hours a week because uh, that's one of the things that people don't realize is, you know, I was sleeping, you know, three, four, five hours a night, you know, I went, I should probably say five, five or six on average. And, um, you know, when I first got you know, in the first few years of it, there were times where I would sleep, go to bed at night, sleep 10 hours, wake up full of energy for about an hour, then go and your body says, you know, time to, you need to take a little nap. And so you lay down and next, and sometimes you lay down and you wake up an hour later. Sometimes you wake up, you know, 10 hours later. So it was, there, there was a point in time where I was sleeping 18, 19 hours a day. Um, and, you know, it, it, that's hard for people who've seen you doing what you were doing 
to see, you know, um, you know, and not understand it. You know, why, why are you sleeping all the time? This is at a point where I had failed six lines of treatment in less than four years. And chemo hadn't worked. And, you know, again, this gets back to doctors and patients' experiences. Basically, uh, chemo, you know, once you've used it once and you've relapsed quickly, um, and by quickly uh, with lymphoma, that's within two years, um, and they, uh, it, from my doctor's patient's experiences, it was better to start trying things outside of chemo because chemo works and then it doesn't work. Um, and so that's why we, we, we kind of put these two drugs together and uh, I just, I just moved down to Florida. So I, I reestablished with uh, another um, doctor down here. And he says, you know, it's interesting that you did that because that's now standard of care. Okay. Because it turns out that this, that that uh, combination, it doesn't work for everyone, but for someone who's in my situation uh, and for those that it does, if you can get to a complete response, the durability statistics are amazing. Well, it turned out it didn't fail. And after about three and a half years on the protocol, uh, I achieved my first true complete response, clean scan, July of 2022. May 31st of 2023 is when we stopped all oncology treatment. Uh, and we did one more scan and we haven't done a scan since. So we're gonna kind of go clinically, uh, see where this goes. Um, you know, if, if they've told me if I want to have a scan, we can do a scan. You'll find that there are people who want to fight and you'll find people who want to quit. And, you know, I never understood people who wanted to quit, but I have since. And, and I get, it, you know, and you understand some of that stuff. And, and, um, and, you know, it's important to try and not be judgmental. Cancer is a big, strong word. But the one thing that you come to realize is that there is a finish line here on earth. Okay. And um, whether you have faith or don't have faith, it's irrelevant because once you hit that finish line, that's it. There's no coming back. There's no going back. You know, there's no redoing anything. So um, for me, you know, I decided to start living life versus fearing death, I guess is a good way of putting it. Um, or, uh, trying to avoid death versus, you know, moving forward. And, you know, you get a lot of people thinking that, you know, if I start eating right and exercising, all that's good for you. Uh, don't get me wrong with this, but that doesn't all of a sudden get rid of your cancer. So. You're either going to fight or you're going to quit. And, and, and both, both answers are fine, okay, because it's, it's what's right for you. Um, clinical trials aren't for everybody, okay, that, that, that's for sure. Um, but if you're going to do them, you need to be more comfortable with the unknown. Okay. The doctors are going to, doctors aren't, you know, a lot of times you get, you know, is the doctor doing the right thing for me? They're, they're trying, everyone tries to do a good job. Okay. So um, they're trying to help you. Okay. And you should feel comfortable with whoever it is that you're talking with and invite, you know, you're, you're trusting them with your life. I mean, with, with, with our situation and, and, you know, you need to find a team that you're most comfortable with to do that. Um, try as best as, as best as you can, you have to try to overcome your fears. Okay. Now that turns out to be, um, a big thing when it comes to cancer. That's why all of a sudden, I don't know if you ever, uh, not that I was in the uh, country, but Tim McGraw's song live like you are dying. Okay. So, you know, I, I asked, you know, I think it was his dad. I asked my dad about this and he said, what do you do? So I jumped out of an airplane. I rode a bull. I, you know, I, you don't necessarily need to do all that stuff, but, um, you know, it's part of dealing with that fear of death. Um, and it's funny because, um, you do some things that, you know, you never thought you would do. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to clinical trials, for me, it became part of my bucket list. I mean, the bucket list for the most part is very selfish. Okay. Um, you know, whether it's jumping out of an airplane or whatever it is you really want to do, um, and you should do it. Okay. Um, but, um, for me, I wanted to have 
you know, some, some you know, I wanted to give something back, or it, I mean, it, not that it, maybe it's a tiny little little piece that I can do to help them learn. Um, that's great, um, but you just never know. I mean, those little sometimes those little things lead to something else, which leads to something else, and you know, one thing leads to another, and all of a sudden we're here. Thank you.